Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and at the very outset, my uh, sincere thanks to ISG, uh, Professor Govind Makaria, Professor Saswat, um, for giving me this opportunity, number one. And secondly, I think I must compliment them and for this wonderful initiative which they have taken. I think uh, they deserve our congratulations on this. Uh, wonderful idea. Uh, so the job, I know we are all passing through a difficult time, but the job I have been assigned uh, today is to talk about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, current and the emerging treatment. So before I go on to the, you know, the treatment part of uh, the fatty liver disease, I think I'll just take you through a little bit of maybe epidemiology. Uh, and then I think we will discuss first the, you know, the current uh, treatment and then followed by the emerging modalities. Uh, when we talk about NAFLD or NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we understand that this is a kind of spectrum. Uh, you can have just fat in the liver, which is known as uh, NAFL or non-alcoholic fatty liver, or well, earlier people used to call it as simple steatosis. We also know that some patients with fatty liver alone can progress on to what we call NASH, uh, which is a severe form of fatty liver disease where you have, in addition to a lone fat, you can have inflammation with or without fibrosis. And if you have NASH, you have a higher propensity to progress on to cirrhosis. And once you have cirrhosis, obviously you can have all the complications of cirrhosis, including HCC. Uh, but then we also need to understand at this point that when we talk about NAFLD, uh, the most common cause of death in patients with fatty liver disease is not uh, liver disease. It's the cardiovascular disease and the malignancies, which means it is because of the kind of milieu uh, these patients have, they are more prone to, you know, uh, the cardiovascular disease and the malignancies and they, and the liver disease comes as the third most common cause of death in patients with fatty liver disease. Uh, I mean, a few years back, I think we started thinking about that. I mean, how about those patients, those who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but do take alcohol and similarly, how about those patients, those who take alcohol in significant amount, but also have metabolic syndrome, like for example, they are obese, diabetic. So based on that, I think a lot of, you know, people started thinking that, can you have a combination of these two diseases? And for the residents, I think the first message I would like to give is the changing nomenclature, which is happening in the area of NAFLD. And this was the commentary which was published uh, late last year, where uh, they have divided the fatty liver disease into two major uh, headings. One is the metabolic predominant fatty liver and the alcohol predominant fatty liver. And within the metabolic predominant fatty liver, you can have subgroup of patients who are taking alcohol. And within the alcoholic predominant fatty liver, you have some patients, those who have metabolic risk factors. So this is the change which is happening in the nomenclature. And I would also like to attract attention of the residents to this very recent paper, which is a pre-proof in the Journal of Hepatology, where this group actually has, this international group has uh, given a, what we call the consensus statement about the new definition of, they are calling it as a metabolic associated fatty liver disease or MAFL. The time doesn't permit me to get into the details of this paper, but you need to know this in detail. And this paper also gives you about the definitions of how do you basically uh, uh, um, classify or define NASH-related cirrhosis and NASH-related HCC and so on. <coughs> I think over the years, I think when I've been um, uh, taking uh, the um, uh, lectures and talks and speaking to the residents, I've got into the habit of, you know, asking questions, but not this is the forum like this, where you can't ask questions. So I have written, written it for myself and I will have to ask questions and give answers simultaneously. So the first question, as I said, I need to know the epidemiology that what is the you know, the prevalence of fatty liver disease, I think uh, over the years, I think, and again, the residents need to know, I would say three studies. The first study is this by Zobair Yonosi. This is a meta-analytic uh, study 
where they looked at all over the globe. And if you look at overall prevalence of fatty liver disease globally was given as around 25%. And if you, highest, if you look at it is in the Middle East and in the South America, but Asia also is not far behind. This is around 27%. Similarly, you also need to know this uh, recent meta-analysis, which was published last year in Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And this was in Asia. And again, if you look at the prevalence of fatty liver in Asia is again close to 29%, which is, you know, a big number. Also, I would suggest residents to know about all these Indian studies. Uh, from the all parts of our country, the uh, West, East, South, and North. And the, you know, look at this, the figures are variable from maybe 8%, which is from the rural part of Bengal, to as high as 53%, uh, which is uh, uh, at Chandigarh, we found in the blood journals. Uh, also, I think for the residents, if you look at the earlier studies from this country, a lot of us actually published uh, this work. <coughs> I'm sorry, and said that the fatty liver disease in India is kind of uh, mild, which means that we do not have uh, uh, many patients with so-called uh, progressive NASH, and we do not have patients with so-called uh, high fibrosis, but again, things are changing as the data is developing. And I must again say that the residents must look at this particular study from ILBS, where they had published uh, three years back data on 1,000 patients of biopsy proof on fatty liver disease. And if you look at this, the Neffold activity score, which defines a NASH, definite NASH by a score of five or more, 61% of people had NASH as defined by the NAS. Similarly, if you look at the fibrosis score, I think a reasonably high number uh, maybe close to around 65% people had uh, <coughs> significant fibrosis, which means F2 or more. Excuse me. Okay. And also, I think uh, this is our recent, uh, you know, presentation at the APDW, which we made uh, in the plenary session. This is the ongoing um, study, which we call it as the Indian Consortium on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, icon D, and we presented there the preliminary data of, of uh, more than 2,000 patients. And if you look at that, um, uh, of the data which was available uh, of ALT in around 1,800 patients, around 45% of them actually had raised ALT. And if you look at the significant fibrosis, which was based on a fibro scan in around 1,300 patients, the significant fibrosis, which was defined as the uh, LSM value of eight or more, was seen in around 40%, and 12% of them already had cirrhosis. So this actually gives us the quantum of, you know, the liver disease, uh, which obviously uh, we are facing in this country, uh, in Asia, and globally, I think, which you all need to be aware. Uh, now let me come down to first what I said, the standard of care today for fatty liver disease. And then, as I said, we will go on to the emerging treatment. And for this, again, I would like the residents to go through this art position paper, which was given by uh, our three, four societies, the Inazel, uh, the Endocrine Society, the Cardiology Society, and the ISG. Uh, but now this is getting a little older, but I think the concepts almost remain the same. Uh, this was in 2015. So what we suggested is that whenever you have a patient with uh, fatty liver disease, NAFL D, uh, obviously you need to exclude alcohol. Uh, you look at the components of metabolic syndrome. I think first step is that you must try to classify patients with NAFL D into whether they have, as I said in the beginning, NAFL, or they have NASH, or they have cirrhosis, or they have HCC. So there are certain ways of doing that. And uh, usually we take the help of various non-invasive uh, tests or markers, uh, and then they will help you in basically assessing whether they have NAFL or NASH or cirrhosis. Why this is important is because the natural history or the prognosis is entirely different in those who have NAFL versus those who have NASH 
uh, because uh, of the outcomes, because of the mortality. Again, there are lots of studies which have shown that patients with NASH, they are more likely to have poorer outcome in comparison to those, those who have NAFL. It doesn't mean that the NAFL cannot progress. There are again studies now showing that the NAFL also can progress. Now, how do you differentiate between the two? Age is a very important, you know, uh, marker, right? As the age advances, your chances of having severe uh, fatty liver disease actually go uh, up. Uh, and I, I keep saying this in uh, most of our meetings that a 20 years boy with a fatty liver disease is entirely different from a 55, 60 years old lady postmenopausal with fatty liver disease. That postmenopausal lady could very well be having high fibrosis or cirrhosis and that young boy could just have what, as I said, NAFL. So other than the age, as I said, the gender is important, which as I said, the mainly the postmenopausal ladies. You look at the AST-ALT ratio. APRI, I think you all know this is the AST platelet ratio index, very helpful. Bedside test, you can just look at the AST platelet, calculate this. But the most important, which is also applicable at the peripheral level, or at the primary healthcare level, or even at the secondary healthcare level, is that you just look at the components of metabolic syndrome. So, you know, the diabetes, obese people, uh, dyslipidemic, hypertensive, I think we all know the components of metabolic syndrome, they are more likely to have what we call severe disease, which is NASH or high fibrosis, very, very important. CK18 is a marker of, you know, apoptosis, Unfortunately, it's not that freely available, but these are this is a score, the FIF4 score and the NFLD fibrosis score, what we call NFS, are free online calculators, which you can very well use uh, uh, in your daily practice and try to characterize or try to prioritize or try to classify your patients into NAFL or NASH. And lastly, but not the least, I think most of our centers are now equipped with what we call the transient elastography, or for that matter, any form of elastography. And if you have high LSM, uh, as I said, we, we defined in our, our study, and the, most of these studies have done it, that if you have LSM of eight or more, I think you tend to have what we call the fibrotic NASH, or this is a significant fibrosis. And depending upon this, if you have all these risk factors, this actually becomes an indication that you may have to do a liver biopsy in your particular patient to confirm that he has NASH with or without fibrosis. So that brings us to the next question, which is very important again for residents. And I keep asking them day in, day out, that what are the indications of liver biopsy in a patient with fatty liver disease? So first and foremost, as I said, is that if you have risk of having steatohepatitis, which is NASH or advanced fibrosis, based on your non-invasive assessment. And these are the ASLD recommendations that if you have metabolic syndrome, if your NFS is high, FIF4 is high, or if your stiffness is high on transient elastography, or if for that matter, even in MR elastography, I think these patients are at a higher risk of having NASH and advanced fibrosis, and we can um, subject these patients to uh, liver biopsy. And the other indication, two indications for liver biopsy is, that if you are not able to exclude any what we call the competing etiology for liver disease or fatty liver or raised transaminases, it could be Hep B, Hep C, autoimmune, Wilsonian. I think there's so many causes which can cause fatty liver, which can cause rise in transaminases. And if you have any of these confounders, I think uh, in clinical practice, we always tend to do liver biopsy in them. And last, which is also important, is that you know, as a part of clinical trials, those who uh, are, and we know that various uh, drugs are under clinical trials, uh, and most often they would take it as a baseline liver biopsy and maybe biopsy at the end of the clinical trial to you know, <clears throat> basically uh, um, look at the treatment outcome. Okay, let me now move on to after the uh, diagnosis and all to the, you know, uh, how do we manage, as I said, in the current scenario. So, once you have a patient with fatty liver disease, as I said, you looked at the metabolic risk factors. The first and foremost is that you must always try to control these metabolic risk factors, right? So if they are there, if they are not there, obviously, I think the, the will come down to that later. So if somebody is diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, 
I think there are various drugs which are recommended in these patients and we must control these risk factors, very, very important. Uh, those who have, are overweight or obese, I think weight reduction is very, very important. How much, how to do that? I think uh, how, how far can we achieve that? I'll come down to that in a little while. But the point I would like to stress here is there's an entity called, which came from our country initially when we were using the international um, criteria for overweight and obesity, so-called the lean effort or lean NASH. These are the people, you know, those who have fatty liver, but do not have so-called overweight or obesity, and uh, they may not have even other any other metabolic risk factors. So these are the groups, they, are, they come here without metabolic risk factors. So even in them and here, the one thing which is recommended in all patients with fatty liver disease is irrespective is the regular exercise. So now what kind of exercise, as I said, how long I'll come down to that because exercise has been shown to improve the insulin sensitivity, you know, which is the major pathogenic mechanism in patients with fatty liver disease. So exercise, exercise, exercise for everybody here, whether they have metabolic risk factors or uh, they don't have metabolic risk factors or they have metabolic risk factors, they have to do it. Okay, now what kind of exercise? I think usually we tend to ask them for what we call the aerobic exercises. So aerobic exercises means that it is the brisk walking, uh, jogging, swimming, cycling, these kind of exercises are usually recommended. But though we not also have data on what we call the resistance exercises, and uh, these days during the lockdown period when I think it may not be possible to go into the gyms or to do the parks for the jogging and walking, I think the resistance exercises or the exercises which you can do at home are also beneficial in patients with fatty liver disease. If you're doing aerobic exercises, the recommendations are you should do at least every day. If not every day, at least five days a week and one hour. And if not one hour, maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, in one session. The idea is that you should be able to reach around uh, 60 to 70 percent of your maximal heart rate. Now, how do you calculate your maximal heart rate? It is basically, it's a very simple formula. You just say 220 minus your age, and that figure you achieve. I think, uh, say, if somebody is, say, 100 years um, uh, old, I mean, I'm saying that, or somebody 60 years old, so 220 minus 60 uh, would be 160. And 60% of that, if you're able to achieve, is what we call the maximal heart rate. And more simpler way is that if you're carrying your mobile with you, during, uh, if you go for a jogging or walking, you should not be able to speak on your phone while you are taking a walk or a brisk walk. That kind of, I think, brisk walk, which is required, which should increase your heart rate, which should um, feel you uh, sweating, and I think that is the aim. So overall, and uh, with this kind of, uh, you know, this thing, the other important aspect is the dietary component, which is very, very important. And the dietary component is that <clears throat> uh, you have to cut down. I think we all understand when we, when we look at the pathogenesis of fatty liver disease, uh, there are three things which are important and which contribute to the fatty liver disease. One is the insulin resistance, as I said, and that insulin resistance basically cause the increased lipolysis from the adipose tissue and there is increased delivery of free fatty acids into the liver, right? So that's the major mechanism. But the other two mechanisms are, one is the de novo lipogenesis, which happens in the liver. And the third is your dietary calorie intake. That's very, very important. So you have to cut down on your calories. And when we say cut down on your calories, and there's a lot of data now available that it's not only the fat reduction, it's the reduction of both fats and carbohydrates, which are very, very important. And then we take the next question is how much reduction? So in general or in clinical practice, what we tell our patients is that you have to reduce your calories by 30%. The simple I mean, way of telling your patients would be that if somebody is taking, say, three chapatis in one session, ask him to come down to two. So one third calories are kind of cut. So the calories are cut, you are exercising more, you are trying to creating what we call a negative balance. So negative balance means that you are burning more calories, you are taking less calories, 
and you're trying to achieve what I just said, weight reduction. And the weight reduction, what is recommended is, I'll come down to that, in clinical practice, we give them a target of 10% over a period of six months. But then depending upon, as I said, which stage the fatty liver comes to you, you can advise them weight reduction. And there's a very good data which is available on this. I think, again, I think residents should know that, that the weight reduction which is recommended if somebody is only an NFL and is overweight or obese, maybe 3% weight reduction or 3 to 5% is good enough. But if you're looking for the inflammation part or NASH resolution, then maybe five to 7% weight reduction is very important. And if you're looking for the fibrosis reduction, then maybe more than 10% or up to 10% weight reduction is very, very important. Having said that, now what we need to see is that these lifestyle interventions, which are so important and they are so helpful and they are so effective, are they really possible? And what are the challenges and are these practical? So there are some problems with lifestyle interventions. One is that, as I said, all patients are not obese. So there's a group of what we call the lean NASH. What do you tell them? So obviously you can't tell them for weight reduction. So you basically just tell them for exercise, as I said, and improve their insulin sensitivity. Uh, the study which I showed you, the pyramid which I showed you about the 5% weight reduction and the 10% weight reduction, if you look at that data, the 5% weight loss was achieved only in one third, which means even if you give target to these people or these patients, only one third of them are actually able to achieve 5% of the body weight. Uh, and if you talk about 10% weight reduction, only 10% of the people are able to reduce their 10% of body weight. I think, so that is the problem. So one is that it is not achievable in most of the people, I would say. The second is, they are not able to sustain because there's something known as weight recidivism, which means that you tend to lose weight, but then over a period of time, if you tend to relax, I think you tend to regain weight. This is known as weight recidivism. There are certain pharmacological interventions for weight reduction, but they are not recommended for fatty liver disease. So I'm not going into the details. So if the, there are problems with the lifestyle interventions, do we have other interventions to help us out in uh, weight reduction? Yes, I think you know. One of them is a surgical modality, the bariatric surgery, and lots of kinds of bariatric surgery, especially the sleeve gastrectomy. But the problem with bariatric surgery is that it is effective in reduction of fat, NASH, but then there are no randomized controlled trials on bariatric surgery. Though we have a lot of cohort studies which have shown that pre and post bariatric surgery people's uh, the severity of fatty liver disease actually have come down. But then because of the absence of randomized control trials, it is still not recommended as a treatment modality for patients with NASH. But yes, if it is otherwise indicated in an obese person, I think you can very well do that and you will find reduction in the severity of fatty liver disease. Now the question again is that how many persons or how many patients actually can be subjected to bariatric surgery. And again, there's a good data available from the bariatric societies. And with they have shown that all those who qualify to for undergo bariatric surgery, which means their BMI is, say some people take it as 35 cutoff or 40 cutoff or whatever you have with these different societies, only less than 1% of the people ultimately are subjected to bariatric surgery, which is a very, you know, minute number, number one. Then there's a problem of, you know, the cost of the surgery, preference of the surgery, accessibility, and mind it, the surgical intervention is not free of morbidity and even mortality. So I think this is a high-end effective, uh, high-end treatment for obesity. And as I said, not recommended for patients with NASH because of the absence of randomized controlled trials. The next is the lesser, you know, which is a lesser, I mean, uh, um, invasive is what we call the endoscopic and bariatric metabolic therapy or EBMT, which is less invasive. But then the problem is, again, we have a very limited data again on this. Various kinds of endoscopic bariatric modalities are now coming up. But again, there are no randomized control trials. And again, it is still not recommended for patients with NASH. Uh, but I would also like to draw attention of the residents to this recent study, which was presented in ASLD uh, in November 2019, 
which actually use this DMR or DMR is basically duodenal mucosal resurfacing, which is, you know, the endoscopic mucosal ablative procedure. And they had patients with type 2 diabetes with fatty liver disease. And what they showed oh, uh, after the procedure that there was a definite uh, over a sham, there was a definite superiority of DMR or duodenal mucosal resurfacing uh, uh, in reduction of uh, uh, the liver fat by which they assessed by MRI PDFF and in their glycemic control by the HbA1c reduction uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes. But then, as I said, the data is very limited, and I think we would expect uh, more studies on endoscopic modalities before we accept them as modalities for treatment of uh, NASH. Uh, now we come to the current pharmacotherapy. Uh, for patients with uh, NAFLD or NASH, uh, I think uh, the pharmacotherapy, which are recommended by most of these societies, including the Inazel and the ISG, are uh, the, these two drugs. One is the pioglutazone and other is the vitamin B. But then, as I said, these data is now getting now old. Uh, and um, this was actually uh, based on, uh, and this is recommended in usually in biopsy proven NASH. Uh, and this was, was based on uh, the uh, landmark study by Professor Sanyal, which is known as the PIVN study, where they compared the pioglitazone with vitamin E and placebo in patients with NASH. Large number of patients, more than 200 and more than 115, I think, each arm. And they showed that both uh, pioglitazone and vitamin E were effective in NASH resolution uh, and um, uh, without worsening of uh, fibrosis. So I think these are the two drugs. Uh, which are recommended, but then there are problems with, you know, with pioglitazone and vitamin E. And the problem is, as I said, both these drugs are recommended in patients, those who are biopsy proven NASH number one. The study, PIVN study was done in patients, those who are non-diabetic. So it is recommended only non-diabetic, though we do have data of using both these molecules in diabetic patients also. And I think uh, uh, other studies have recommended that you can use them even in diabetic patients also. Uh, uh, they are not recommended in cirrhosis, but I would like to show you some data in cirrhotics. The pioglitazone also has a lot of, you know, issues like weight gain, uh, pedal edema, and cardiac issues. And there is a um, theoretical risk of carcinoma urinary bladder with pioglitazone. With vitamin E, again, there is a, some risk of carcinoma prostate. And there was initially data which had shown uh, increase in all-cause mortality with vitamin E, but then that was uh, later, uh, you know, uh, refuted by the other studies. So uh, this is the data I wanted to show that the vitamin E, though recommended in non serotics and in the non-diabetics, but this is a recent, uh, you know, uh, retrospective analysis by uh, Naga Chalasani's group from Indiana University, US, and where they looked at around 236 patients with biopsy-proven NASH and bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, which means high fibrosis or cirrhosis. And they had, you know, uh, two groups, controls and the vitamin E users, and they had a uh, longer follow-up here. And if you look at this, vitamin E users, they had a higher transplant-free survival and lower rate of hepatic decompensation in comparison to the control group. And this was both in the group with and without diabetes. And the, uh, uh, so I think there is a, no, you know, rational, I would say in clinical practice that I think even if somebody is a cirrhotic and if you are short of drugs, I think vitamin E based on this retrospective analysis could be a, you know, choice. But then, as I said, we would probably need more data uh, in high fibrosis or uh, cirrhosis, uh, which was an exclusion criteria in the uh, Pavan study. Okay, as I said, pioglitazone and vitamin E, so what more? I think at this stage, I would have asked uh, residents, what next is the standard of care in pharmacotherapy? But I know I can't get answers, so I have to give the answer. So new molecule, which has been added onto the list is what we call the saroglitazar. So the saroglitazar is a recently approved drug by DCGI in India for patients with NASH, uh, again, without cirrhosis. And um, uh, this, as we know, is a PPAR alpha and a gamma uh, agonist. And before I show you data on Saroglitazar, uh, I thought, I think for the residents, it may be important to slightly understand 
about the pathobiology of these nuclear receptors and the transcription factors, which are very, very important. And then you would actually better understand um, the role of these PPAR agonists. And when I come down to the FXR agonists, I think it will be easier for you to understand. So I think um, uh, when we look at the pathobiology, I think the important is we need to understand that as human beings, uh, all our cells or tissues would actually require glucose or fatty acids as an energy source, we know that. And there are certain uh, tissues or cells which would depend totally on glucose because they don't have any oxidative uh, capacity, like for example, erythrocytes and retinal cells and all. Brain also depends on you know, glucose because fatty acids do not cross the blood brain barrier. So, you know, this glucose and fatty acids are so important for us, right? Uh, so how do we get these glucose and fatty uh, acids? Obviously, I think uh, from our diet, but then whenever there's an ele elementary glucose shortage, which means that there's a problem, you're fasting or whatever, I think there's a mobilization of the hepatic glycogen by a process, what we call the glycogenolysis, and there's a breakage of uh, glycogen into glucose, so we get glucose from there. And if it, that also falls short, then the liver tries to synthesize glucose, which is a process known as gluconeogenesis. So, you know, this gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis is very, very important for our human body, right? Uh, coming to the fatty acids, I mean, there are certain organs which have a high mitochondrial oxidative capacity, like, uh, you know, liver, skeletal muscle, heart, and renal cortex they can use fatty acids. And we also know that these fatty acids are stored as uh, triacylglycerols in adipose tissue. And the source again is the dietary lipid intake. And there's something which I said in the beginning is a de novo lipogenesis from glucose, which happens in the liver and in the adipose tissue, right? So whenever there's a glucose shortage, fatty acids actually come down to the rescue. So the fatty acids are then released from the adipose tissue by this hormone sensitive lipase. And then there's a fatty acid oxidation, which is happening, which actually provides energy for gluconeogenesis. And these fatty acids can also be converted into ketone bodies. And we know uh, in contrast to fatty acids, uh, in contrast to the uh, fatty acids, the ketone bodies, they can actually cross blood brain barrier and can be a source of energy for the brain. So now, I mean, so much of thing is happening, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, and uh, the looking at the tissues, all this requires what we call a very tight regulation of the metabolic pathways. Now, how do you kind of modulate these pathways? How do you quickly switch to these pathways? How do the body senses that, I mean, now the glucose is less, the fatty acids have to come in. All these are taken care uh, are something known as transcription factors. So the transcription factors are basically nothing but they are proteins. They control the rate of your genetic information from DNA to mRNA and they bind to a specific DNA sequence and then they kind of, you know, generate or they activate various genes for, you know, the synthesis and for the switch of all these metabolic, you know, requirements which are happening in the body. So that brings me to the uh, final thing on this, that the PPARs, what we will talk now, and the farnesoid X receptors both belong to a family of what we call the nuclear receptors. Uh, they, they actually um, uh, are uh, involved in the glucose metabolism and they actually act as the transcription factors. Right? So this is how, uh, you know, the, uh, as I said, once you have the ligands, and then this acts on the, you know, um, the biohydroderma, they activates, you know, the either the PPAR uh, response elements or the FXR response elements and the signals are kind of generated. And finally, then you have uh, the effects on either fatty acid oxidation or improve in insulin sensitivity and all. So let me just show you now the data on seroglitazar. So this was, uh, you know, the phase two study, which was, you know, presented uh, in ASLD again last year which is known as the evidence four study. And this study showed that uh, the seroglitazar does improve the liver fat by as assessed by the MRPDFF and the ALT. So I think this was a phase two study for the evidence four. And then uh, we recently, uh, this study was presented in the apostle. This is known as the evidence two study, which was a phase three histological based study in India 
conducted in 10 centers with 102 patients. And this study actually showed a statistically significant reduction um, um, uh, uh, in proportion of patients in respect to the decrease in effort activity score by say two points uh, and I think in comparison to a placebo group and there were a lot of other you know secondary ad points and based on this this drug as I said has now been approved for use in patients with NASH which are F1 to F3 uh, for use uh, in patients with fatty liver disease. So I think uh, this is all which I wanted to say about the Current management, I think before we go on to the emerging, and if Professor Saraswat and Professor Makaria uh, permit me, I think we can have take some questions at this stage and then move on to the emerging treatment modalities, um, which I will take maybe another 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, well, uh, um, Ajay, if you want to take questions, I think we have already piled up about uh, close to 100 questions uh, people have fired in already. Mm -hmm. So I think what I could do is to start off with what I think are some of the important ones. And uh, then depending on uh, what the advice is from the, our timekeepers, uh, probably we take five minutes for questions, uh, Govind. Does that sound okay? We take five minutes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's take five minutes for questions. So I'll try to sort out uh, of these 90 questions and... Uh, uh, some of the interesting questions are related to diagnosis. Um, I think uh, important people, people like Shiva from Vizag and right. also uh, uh, one of our old alumni, Avimal Saradeva, who's now in Rajkot and is practicing is very, very inquisitive. And there are others. The basic question is that today, can we start pharmacologic therapy for NASH uh, with these uh, drugs that we have spoken about without liver biopsy? Because you mentioned that one of, if you're suspecting advanced fibrosis and other situations, even the ASLD recommends liver biopsies. Right. But in people uh, either with suspected advanced fibrosis or otherwise, can we start pharmacologic therapy without a liver biopsy? Medical legally, is it safe for some of the concerns? What are your thoughts, Sajid? Uh, I think yeah, that's a very uh, pertinent or important question as far as I would say the clinical practice is concerned. And in clinical practice, I must admit that we do start these drugs uh, without liver biopsy also for various reasons. And the major reason always is that the patients may not agree to undergo liver biopsy, number one. And if your non-invasive assessment is suggesting you that this patient has got and is likely to have, as I said, or non-invasive assessment, are likely to have significant inflammation, or significant fibrosis based on your non-invasive assessment, we can take a case-to-case -case decision or an individual decision of starting these drugs. And then out of these, I think I personally, my experience is that we feel more comfortable with vitamin E, which is, you know, a safer drug. And we tend to give these drugs for around six months even without biopsies. And as I said, we have, after this retrospective analysis, we have also started using vitamin E, even in our um, high fibrosis or serotics without doing the liver biopsy. That is uh, on pyoglitazone vitamin E. Now we have a new molecule armamentarium in the armamentarium, which is seroglitazar. And earlier this drug seroglitazar was recommended only in patients with diabetic dyslipidemia but now, as I said, the DCGI has improved, uh, have uh, pro I mean, approved this drug for you know uh, NASH also. So, if you look at the real life data on the usage of seroglitazar, I think there's a huge data which is available in more than I would say 5,000 patients uh, where people have not been subjected to liver biopsy. They have been given seroglitazar, and people have shown reduction in not only in their ALT values but also in their CAP score based on the fibro scan. Uh, the controlled attenuation parameter, which is a marker of hepatic steatosis, and their LSM score, which is basically a marker of hepatic fibrosis. So we do have a real-life data. And as I said, ICON-D, we are collecting this all this real-life data. So I think real-life practice or clinical practice is entirely different from your academic practice or your, you know, the what the societies would recommend. So you would say that it is reasonable under yeah. given evidence to begin pharmacologic therapy uh, especially with the drugs you have named where the evidence is there without a liver biopsy and sure, sure. legally it should not be a problem for anybody prescribing these medicines. Sure. So that is... Can I ask a question? Uh, this is a yeah, question. go ahead. Yeah. This is a question from gynecologist. Gynecologist. So gynecologists are also log, logged in. Some of them. They, they did that. This is Sumal Lal from Gurgaon. 
which is hmm. asked a question, a, a lady with a PCOS has fatty liver, right. normal enzymes, would you prescribe vitamin E to her? Uh, see, the PCOS is again, I think because of the time and I was focusing only on the treatment because we know is a disease which is again associated with insulin resistance, right? And I think there's a good data which is available about treating fatty liver disease in ladies or in women with PCOS with insulin sensitizing drugs. And the most often the drug which is used in these women is metformin. Right. So I would suggest that I think uh, if and if they're otherwise using or if they have fatty liver disease uh, yeah, and if you want to use, I think metformin would be maybe a first line drug. But then if he or she um, in this in PCOS, if she qualifies for vitamin E, right, uh, I think based on your non-invasive assessment and even if she has PCOS, I think vitamin E can also be. Okay. Okay. I think. Uh, another interesting question has come from Dr. S.K. Sharma, New Delhi, and he says that many patients with uh, fatty liver have also got metabolic syndrome and are on beta blockers. You have given certain recommendations about exercise, how you calculate the maximal heart rate. So should they exercise? How much exercise? What heart rate should they target when they are beta blockaded? Practically important questions. What do you think, uh, Jay? Uh, I know it's an important question, but a difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> I think uh, the, uh, as I said, again, fatty liver disease is, is a part and parcel or what we call a hepatic component of metabolic syndrome. So it's not only hypertension. I mean, they have so many other comorbidities. And I think they could be on so many other drugs, could be statins, could be beta blockers, could be aspirin or so many other things. And for them, how much to exercise, I think, uh, again, if you look at our position paper, we're very given very clear cut recommendations that a cardiology evaluation or an evaluation by cardiologists in that scenario would be very, very important before you, I think, take our advice, which we actually give for their point of view. Right. So heart rate may not help you in deciding the end point of exercise. People and they may be having limited exercise tolerance. Sure. So uh, banking on exercise in this group may be a bit of a problem. Uh -huh. Right. About, about drug therapy. Um, no, sorry. Before we go on to drug therapy, there was a set of questions from different people about differentiating alcoholic hepatitis from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, particularly in people who do consume alcohol. In <clears> fact, <throat> one questioner, I've not been able to note the name, has asked, what is the evidence on the basis of which you are restricting alcohol in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, things to that extent? Since there is a common problem, maybe you could uh, quickly address that, Ajay? Yeah, I think two things. Um, uh, uh, one is, as I said, I think in, again in clinical practice, I think, and this happens uh, very often in our clinical practice in this part of the country in Punjab and Chandigarh, where I think we do see people uh, who are obese, diabetic, and full-blown metabolic syndrome and also consuming alcohol, right? And uh, either in insignificant amount or in significant amount. So this combination is a real problem. But if you look at the society guidelines or for that matter, any guidelines, patients with NAFLD, if they ask you a question, whether they can take alcohol or not, the answer would be for heavy drinking is a big no. Now, nobody talks about the mild or moderate drinking and how do you define that again would be a big question because there was some data which was initially published that some amount of uh, a special wine could even be helpful for fatty liver disease. But then if you ask me in clinical practice, most of the patients actually what we see in effort are actually kind of non-drinkers or teetotalers. But then even if they are taking socially, I think we tell them, we, we kind of discourage them for taking, uh, uh, you know, alcohol number one. The second is about the differentiation between the ASH and NASH. I think there are two th things which are very important here. One is obviously the history. Second is you look at in, in NAFLD, it is if the enzymes are elevated, it's the ALT, which is more than AST, or they are side by side. But if it's an ASH, the AST will be higher than ALT number two. And I think the other thing which I would like to tell here is, uh, again, very important for the residents would be that they should... Uh, go on to the Mayo Clinic site and the Mayo Clinic people have given a score. This is known as an ANI score. ANI is alcoholic hepatitis and non-alcoholic hepatitis index. And there they put in, you know, the OTG level, diabetic status, AST, ALT and all, give you a very score. 
and it has a very good accuracy in telling you whether you have ash or nash you know and then there are other ways you look at the mcv you look at other things i think on which basis you can differentiate uh, we can go now to the uh, other part of your talk <clears throat> okay okay how much time do i have uh, as little as you can but uh, so can you give me 10 12 minutes or 15 minutes at the call sir 10 minutes well let's see at 1253 now so maybe at 10 minutes if you can try and... okay okay i'll finish in 10 minutes okay 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 so as i said i think um, the uh, the emerging uh, modalities uh, again can be divided into two uh, which are you know we are, you, we, we do have certain available drugs in the market in india and elsewhere but they are not approved for nash so we would need some more data on that and i have put this also into emerging treatment and there are certain drugs which are still in clinical trials right so i'll briefly tell you for example metformin as i said is not approved for nash and the same group the nagachala sani group actually has come up again with this retrospective analysis which is again published last year with the use of metformin in again cirrhosis and high fibrosis and they have again shown that the patients those who are metformin users uh, they had a lower risk of overall mortality or for that matter even transplants and lower risk of hcc so i think metformin i personally feel is a very good drug which actually needs more evaluation both in non cirrhotics and in cirrhotics but i i, I have that way i put it as a emerging drug and i think we need more data uh there are a lot of anti diabetic drugs which are being evaluated and uh, you know we, one of them is the liraglutide and this was one study which was again published 4 years back so called the lean trial which actually showed improvement in nas score but as i said we still need more data on this available drug not recommended and uh other than the liraglutide you know this is G glp1 analog i think the semaglutide is another drug which is coming up now and the data is still building on that but we will need some more uh, data on that probiotics again this was our work which we published last year again i think more data is required but as a proof of concept study we showed that the probiotics because of the role of the gut microbiota and the bacterial overgrowth in patients with fatty liver disease may have some role and for that matter it would be i think it would be uh, true even for the fmt uh, the fecal you know microbiota transplantation for which again the drugs are, uh, the trials are still on for fatty liver disease so i'm not going into the so the modulation of gut microbiota is another one so now let me come on to the residents about the ongoing clinical trials in patients with the nash and for this i think uh, if you are appearing for the exam and if you are asked for the kinds of clinical trials i think you may also be asked that what are phase 2 trials what are phase 2 a trials phase 2 b trials what are phase 3 trials because ultimately it is very difficult to remember the names of all the drugs with the large battery which are being tested in patients with nash so for the case of simplicity i would suggest the residents to remember that these are the drugs which are in phase 2 and these are the drugs in phase 3 and you know and this is also possible that the drugs which are being tested in phase 2 and if they are found effective only then they will go to phase 3 but uh and in phase 3 they may or may not be effective that's very important and if the phase 2 find that they are not effective obviously they will not go on to phase 3 so what is phase 2 as i said phase 3 which drugs are in phase 2 phase 3 i think it is very important for you to understand that number 1 uh second thing which i again as i said it is very difficult for you to remember all the names what you should remember is the site of action of these drugs so the, the the drugs have been divided into three way categories one are the drugs which are known as the metabolic uh, drugs or they act at the metabolic pathways whether they are insulin sensitizers they improve insulin sensitivity or they reduce the liver fat uh, like as i said pepar agorist here ramcol here right or acc inhibitors will come down to that or they could be trying to decrease the inflammation so what we call the anti anti inflammatory drugs or they could be trying to reduce the fibrosis they are known as anti fibrotic drugs so i think you should try to you know remember this that which drugs you know the fxr are metabolic drugs pepar are metabolic right your chemokine inhibitors are anti inflammatory but also anti fibrotic your apoptosis inhibitor asp1 inhibitors 
they are you know anti inflammatory right so i think this is easier to remember that i mean which are which are the pathways they are basically kind of uh, acting on now let me again tell you data on some of these drugs which are as i said could be phase 2 phase 3 failed in this so this is one drug uh, from genfit and we talk about seroglitazar which is a ppar alpha and a gamma dual agonist this is another p dual ppar agonist which is ppar alpha and delta and this is known as alafibranor mm. and this alafibranor study from uh, multi center study was published uh, uh, again around 4 years back and this was a phase 2 study which on you know the analysis by a, a redefined definition found it to be better uh, than the placebo with the resolution of nash without worsening of fibrosis and based on this phase 2 data um, uh, i think there is a ongoing phase 3 study which probably you just can remember is a resolvit trial uh, because the phase 2 data had shown the efficacy of 120 mg of alafibranor so now they are recruiting a large number of patients so this is how the phase 3 trials are different from phase 2 you have a large number of patients so it's around 2000 here and then you have a longer follow up maybe one year or so and they have already done uh the interim analysis at uh, the plan to do interim analysis at 18 months so you can do that right so you can remember this chart the other category of drugs which again belong to the metabolic pathway targeting are the as i said the farnesoid x receptor agonists and as i said these these are the nuclear receptors and they act as the transcription factors which i tried to explain you earlier so one of the drug which is ifxr agonist is from the intercept and this is known as obiticolic acid or in short we call it as oca and the synthetic this is synthetic ligand for the fxr receptors but the natural ligand is the cdca but the oca is around 100 times more potent than you know cdca or the kinodeoxycolic acid and the fxr agonists have been shown not only to have role in the bile acid metabolism but also to lower the hepatic triglyceride content improve the insulin sensitivity and hyperglycemia so based on this again 5 years back this was a phase 2 data which was published this was known as a flint 2 study where they showed that the oca 25 was better than placebo in no worsening of fibrosis and in decreasing the nas score of more than 2 2 or more than 2 points and based on this there was a phase 3 study which was initiated and this was known as a region rate trial and the interim data of region rate trial was presented last year in easel and they showed that the oca which is 10 mg and 25 mg and the primary endpoint which is the fibrosis improvement by more than one stage without worsening of fibrosis was better in oca <clears throat> in comparison to the placebo so based on this now the company has actually filed for the approval of this drug to us fda and also to the european authority and before this you know covid the pandemic um, it was thought that there is a possibility that this oca may be approved uh, in the middle of this year for the treatment of you know uh, nash uh, the other drug is as i said is a chemokine inhibitor which is a sinicrevirox and the phase 2 data again was published 2 years back and this was known as a centro trial and this centro trial actually showed that the cvc was not only safe and well tolerated but uh, um, it does not improve the steatohepatitis, to hepatitis but there was a clinically some modest impact on the fibrosis so based on this there is again a phase 3 study which is going on and which is known as an aurora study and they are again recruiting a large number of patients in this molecule called sinicrevirox uh, which is as i said is a chemokine 3 and chemokine 5 inhibitor category of anti inflammatory but also has an anti fibrotic drug uh then there are two drugs which are again that i would say anti apoptotic drugs and one of them is the you know apoptosis also plays a major role in the pathogenesis of fatty liver disease one of these drugs is a pancaspase uh, oral pancaspase inhibitor amdihasm and this data was presented again last year november 19 uh, on the use of amdihasm in patients with nash 
with F1 to F3 fibrosis, and this was a negative study, which showed that the emery casin, despite the you know this thing, the primary endpoint of fibrosis improvement was not met, and similar findings were observed. <coughs> sorry for Nash resolution. So, which means this was a negative study. Another anti-apoptotic molecule, which actually came as a big bang, was a serum surdin. This is a molecule from Gilead, and this is an apoptosis signal kinase one inhibitor, what we call the AS1 inhibitor. And again, this phase two data was published in 2018 in Hepatology, and this actually showed it to be effective in improving, you know, not only fat but also fibrosis based on non-invasive assessment like MR-PDFF and MR elastography and also an MR uh, uh, biopsy, but the number here was small. This was 72. So based on this, uh, as I said, this is the, they found it to be effective. Based on this, they, the Gilead then started two very large clinical trials. And these clinical trials were called as Stellar 3 and Stellar 4. And these two studies, their trials, they basically, uh, Stellar 3 was for the uh, patients, those who had, uh, uh, you know, F, up to F3 fibrosis. And for F4 fibrosis, which is compens uh, compensated cirrhosis, this was Stellar 4. But unfortunately, both these trials, Stellar 3 and 4, also turned out to be negative and were prematurely, you know, terminated. And uh, so the Salonsertib as a drug is also kind of out. Now, I think since I think there's a problem, and I think the NASH is a difficult disease, I would say, to control or to dissolve as far as the pharmacotherapy is concerned. So then came the concept that the individual drugs, if they are not working, uh, can we combine the drugs? And again, uh, the Gilead came with this, you know, another clinical trial, which again, the data has been recently shared, the results. So, you know, this is a molecule called FOCO, uh, the FOSOCOSTAT, which was the Gilead molecule GS976. So this is an ACC inhibitor. So what is ACC? ACC is an acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme. So what does it do? This is basically an enzyme which basically acts as a rate-limiting enzyme for the conversion of acetyl-CoA to melanine-CoA. And that is how, you know, the fat is synthesized. So if you stop or break this or uh, inhibit this enzyme, ACC, by this, the ACC inhibitor, the acetyl-CoA is not converted into melanyl-CoA, and that is how the lipid synthesis would go down. So that is the ACC inhibitor for Socostat. So what they did, they combined this for Socostat with Silofaxor. Silofaxor is an FXR agorist, different from the OCA. And they combined it with the cell uncertainty, which I said was a ASK1 inhibitor. So they have three molecules combined together. And the entry points were patients with bridging fibrosis and compensated cirrhosis. And this was known as the ATLAS trial. But then, unfortunately, we have had no, we are, the data on this is also available. And this is also a negative study. So the, even the combination of these drugs has not been found to be effective in improving fibrosis in patients with bridging fibrosis and compensated cirrhosis related to NASH. So I think I'll summarize now uh, what I said, and I think we, then we can take some questions. So as I said uh, in last maybe this 40, 50 minutes is that uh, if you have a patient with fatty liver disease, nafl D, try to categorize them whether they have NAFL or they have NASH or they have NASH cirrhosis or they have HCC. Uh, I have not purposefully discussed about the treatment of cirrhotics and HCC, which are related to NASH. Uh, I think this is beyond the scope of this lecture. And I have predominantly focused on the NAFL, NASH, and maybe NASH with some high fibrosis. And once you have characterized, and or once you have classified these patients based on your non-invasive assessment or on biopsy, whatever you have done, as far as the treatment is concerned, you have to advise exercise for everybody. And I told you what kind of exercise, how long, how many days a week, and how much this I have already told you. And if the patients are overweight or obese, weight reduction is must. And I also showed you data that with lifestyle modifications, if you are able to achieve 
the desired body weight, you do get improvement in your inflammation and fibrosis. But the problem, as I said, is that it is difficult to achieve and may be difficult to sustain. Finally, if you're using drugs, I think now we have three drugs which are at least available in India. One, early, obviously two were the vitamin E and the pyoglitazone, which are recommended, as I said, for biopsy-proven rash. But we did, we did discuss that if given, I mean, in a particular patient, uh, if, even if the biopsy is not possible, you can take a decision for that. The new drug which has come in, uh, uh, which is available now in India, approved by the DCGI for treatment with NASH, again for F1 to F3 fibrosis, not for cirrhotics, is seroglitazar, which is, as I said, is a PPAR alpha and a gamma agonist. Uh, we also need to understand that fatty liver disease, as I said, is, is a, emerging as a multi-system disease. You can have cardiac involvement, you could be diabetic, you are more prone to have diabetes, hypertensive, you could be have chronic kidney disease, malignancy, osteoporosis, I think. So you have to see the patient in totality. Don't only focus on liver. I think you have to take care of all other systems, which is very, very important. Finally, the emerging treatment, I divided into two. The drugs which are available, but not yet approved. I showed you some data on metformin. I did show you data on seraglutide. I didn't show you data on SGLT inhibitors, which are other drugs which are used for diabetics. And there's some data which says that they do improve fat. I also didn't show you data on vitamin D. Again, some meta-analysis saying that it could be helpful. I did show you our own data on the use of probiotic in patients with NASH as a proof of concept study. Uh, as far as the drugs which are in clinical trials, as I showed you, there are a lot of drugs in clinical trials and in a short time, it is really not possible for me to cover all these drugs. But I gave you the concept that you should know that you must remember that what phase of particular clinical trial that particular drug is. You must say, is it a phase two study or a phase three study? You should also look at that drug, where does it act? whether it acts on the metabolic pathways, whether it is an anti-inflammatory drug or it is an anti-fibrotic drug. Uh, the drug which may sooner be approved and we hope that it gets, which is the obeticolic acid, but obeticolic acid also is not free of, you know, issues and the side effects like pruritus and hypertriglycidemia. And people are now calling it as the interferon um, of NASH like you have had in hepatitis C. So we can discuss this more on this. And lastly, as I said, people are not trying because it's so difficult disease to tackle. People are not trying the combinations of various drugs and we need to have more data on these combinations. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, I think my sincere thanks to the ISG, Professor Govind, Professor Saraswat, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, I think... Uh... Um, Arun, um, Ajay, as expected, a masterly exposition and uh, coverage of a very vast area with a lot of issues and very uh, succinct and clear answers were provided. But I think as uh, at last count, we are flooded with over 250 questions. So now depending on uh, um, Professor Makharia's signals, how long we can go on, I can, we'll start with some of the more important ones. A lot of people, I think there must be at least a dozen or more people from different parts of the country, uh, including uh, Dr. G.K. Pati from Hyderabad, Vini Tomar from Hyderabad, P.K. Reddy from Chennai, Dr. Uh, Subhash Agarwal from Surat, want to know what is the current status of urso deoxycholic acid in the management of NASH? Because it is one of the molecules you haven't, uh, most of us don't talk about it much, but it is definitely extensively used in the country. So in evidence-based, currently, what would be your recommendation and uh, um, comments on URSO? I think urso deoxycholic acid has a long story in fatty liver disease. And if you look at the earlier studies, I think uh, it did show that the biochemical improvement does occur with urso deoxycholic acid, which is the ALT improvement. The problem happened when uh, uh, many years back, a placebo control trial was published in hepatology which actually showed that the urso deoxycholic acid was no better than placebo in causing the histological improvement in patients with NASH. So that is how it actually took a backseat. But then another concept came in, 
and that was the use of high dose orso deoxycholic acid and in that direction also uh, if i can recall there were two studies which were conducted with a high dose uh, orso deoxy as high as maybe 25 mg per kg and i think those studies also were not uh, very didn't show uh, to be very effective so based on that if you look at the recommendations from most of the societies uh, whether this is our indian societies or the european or the american societies they will not recommend orso deoxycholic acid for the treatment of nash but again coming to the clinical practice and i must admit that we do use this drug in our clinical practice so i mean there are patients those who do not fit into your so called uh, nash on a non invasive assessment right and they may have slight elevation of liver enzymes and if you just give them lifestyle modifications i think the the as the you know uh, the patients usually are not kind of satisfied whether you call it as a placebo effect or whatever we tend to use orso deoxycholic acid in this subgroup of patients those who do not fit into nash non invasively and you have to give them some drug i think we do use this in clinical practice and to tell you the truth we do see biochemical improvement in these patients but the problem as i said is that there is no histological data on this right so probably it is one of those drugs that we used a lot when there weren't many drugs around it does have some benefit biochemically but not histologically evidence is does not show histologic advantage so as better drugs come along we should probably be thinking of phasing out the use of orso by and by would you agree with that i agree sir I agree sir right uh, serogletazar has evoked a lot of interest and enthusiasm and there must be at least about 20 25 questions on different aspects of serogletazar so i'll try and cover a few of them one by one um people have already been using serogletazar in the context of fatty liver whether in diabetics or otherwise so uh, interesting question is from dr ravi thakur in varanasi who says that after the after starting serogletazar once there is an improvement in transaminases but a rebound increase in transaminases is noted when it is discontinued so what should be the duration of therapy and what should be end points when we start serogletazar i think um, i agree with him and this is not peculiar to serogletazar this is peculiar to all pharmacological therapy which are used in patients with nash as long as you keep giving pharmacotherapy the enzymes would settle down and that is said they may improve your histology but the moment you stop the drugs i think uh, the disease would come back the enzymes would come back and the histological worsening would may also happen so i think that's a learning point that this is a metabolic disease this is a part and parcel of metabolic syndrome i think alone with pharmacotherapy or more than that i think we have to take care of our risk factors we have to continue to apply lifestyle modifications and pharmacotherapy uh, is not the answer pharmacotherapy is answer only in a sub group of patients those i would say personally those who have advanced disease those who have high fibrosis and you want to reduce the extent of fibrosis those who they have high inflammation you want to reduce the inflammation which means that you don't want them to progress on to cirrhosis i mean this is the aim in any liver disease whether it's hep b or hep c your ultimate aim is that they should not progress on to you know cirrhosis so if that is the high risk group and that is where this drug is actually recommended so whether it's serogletazar or it's uh, any drug so if, if you ask me the duration the trial phase 3 which we did in india for 102 patients and the drug uh, the uh, results which are presented in a parcel and based on which the dcj has given approval this drug was given for one year so if you have to use serogletazar in a patient with nash i would say one year but then as i said don't forget the lifestyle modifications drug is just you know a, a short kind of an arrangement i would say i think or to reduce the inflammation or the fibrosis but ultimately it is the lifestyle interventions right so what you're saying is at least one year but at the end of the one year things have got to have normalized or come under control for you to considering stopping it if as in a diabetic patient you get euglycemia you get normal hba1c but uh, you discontinue and things uh, slip back again so if the basic processes have not been checked weight loss hasn't been achieved and then chances are that you may have to continue it for a longer duration yeah but we need to have more data on that we need uh, more data are required yeah, yeah. you are recommending based on current data yeah. 
uh, the other the other important question is related to uh, dr kundan kumar from jamshedpur his question is that now that we have seroglitazar pioglitazone you spoke about and vitamin e today how should you be using them in what order or in priority and dr ashish gupta has a similar question from noida he says what do you think about combining the three vitamin e pioglitazone and seroglitazar in you already talked of combinations with newer drugs how about combining older drugs so i think the last question first i think it's a very good idea so i think um, i would this word i would call it as an indian jogad so i think maybe <laughs> Uh, we can we have three drugs available and let's do a clinical trial where we combine vitamin e pioglitazone and uh, seroglitazar and see if i think this does wonders i think uh, good idea but then um, uh, coming to the order which by which we should be using as i said in our clinical practice we have hardly been using pioglitazone because of the issues which i said predominantly the weight gain pedal edema and the cardiac issues so our experience predominantly largely till date has been with vitamin e in clinical practice uh but then now with the coming in of seroglitazar uh, and i think it's a safe drug there were no side effects which were major side effects which were reported so i think we can choose either of the two either seroglitazar or vitamin e and you can even divide i think the the trial on saro uh, the entry point was not diabetic dyslipidemia so even if you don't have diabetic dyslipidemia you can still choose you know seroglitazar but then if there is diabetic dyslipidemia i think saro should be given the preference and if there is no diabetic dyslipidemia it could be either of the two that would be my answer all right okay uh, another uh, similar question on the same lines i comes from dr sanjay saxena in dehradun many people who are uh, already on statins now that seroglitazar is available and can we combine seroglitazar statins or is it to be considered discontinuing statins if seroglitazar are used uh, what would you say uh, again i think a uh, difficult question but then uh, we know that the the seroglitazar does have effect on dyslipidemia so you have to probably individualize you know patient there is a i mean uh, if you using statins for dyslipidemia and now you start using seroglitazar i think uh depending upon how your lipid uh, profile stays you can take off maybe statins yeah so finally a quick question on indications lawrence peter from um, bangalore asks whether seroglitazar has been used for pcos for polycystic ovarian syndrome and another question is regarding a seroglitazar for for lean nash would you consider it for lean nash this comes from dr zoe bin nagpur what do you think so two question so the p cos i think again the uh, let me say here the manufacturers of uh, the seroglitazar uh, were uh, very keen to do this clinical study where they were trying to include patients with p cos with fatty liver and the uh, uh, usage of seroglitazar in them but then somehow finally they landed up doing a study where the fatty liver disease was kind of taken off so they are using this drug and i if i am right there could be this study which is going on where they are looking at the efficacy of seroglitazar in pcos minus the fatty liver disease earlier was fatty liver disease as i right. said so it's a minus the fatty liver disease so i'm not aware of the results on that number one and what was the second question on the lean nash so again i think uh, if you look at the data so see if you have nash whether you are lean or whether you are obese doesn't really matter if you're using the pharmacotherapy if your biopsy is showing you that you have f2 fibrosis you have inflammation and you fit into the definition of nash i think you can very well use seroglitazar there also right uh, finally about a uh, last thing on seroglitazar was a concern with its side effect profile uh, one question from dr rakesh intravandram was have you seen thrombocytopenia on uh, seroglitazar and the other was is there an increased myocardial infarction risk or any cardiac risk related to seroglitazar reported in uh, studies and in general what are the side effects to be aware of when you use sero uh, i think again i will come down to the data on that 102 patients which was again uh, presented in that particular study which is uh, the you know the phase 3 data uh in that particular study there were no cardiac events myocardial infarction or infarction or any other 
or thrombocytopenia, significant thrombocytopenia, which was reported. Uh, real life, again, there's a huge data, as I said, on more than 5,000 patients. Again, I think in that, if I remember right, I think the cardiac issues were not the major issues with seroglitazar. So I don't think largely it's a safe drug. Uh, I mean, some of our patients did complain of some, um, uh, you know, minor side effects like uh, the fatigability, headache or GI symptoms, but no major issues uh, which we encountered with seroglitazar. All right. For us, what we will have a now limited time. We have okay. 1.22 already. So okay. can I ask you two small questions which are there for, again from the video of the audience. Hmm. Number one, that uh, Ajay, if you treat a patient with NAS, hmm. how long do you treat? How many what? months? How many years? No, no, no. Is this, is, this is a lifelong disease. It's like diabetes. So it's, it's, it's a metabolic disease. There is no duration. The duration we are talking is only about the duration of pharmacotherapy. I mean, I, I tell you in our clinical practice, once we see an ecogenic liver, on ultrasound, uh, I think it's very difficult to get rid of that ecogenicity from ultrasound, right? So whatever you may do. So like you say, now, once hepatitis B, always hepatitis B. So same, I would, I mean, uh, I've started believing that it's very difficult to get rid of maybe fat from the liver. And even if you do that, even if you're able to do that, which is obviously possible with lifestyle interventions and pharmacotherapy, your treatment, which is nothing but lifestyle interventions, have to continue for long or maybe lifelong. If people, there's a good data to say that, and there's a data from the Piven study, which have shown that if you stop pharmacotherapy and if you tend to gain weight, you tend to, you know, um, become obese and diabetic, your liver disease may kind of progress. I, I think the question is, how long do you, if you start a NAS patient with uh, any of the drug which you described? So that I've already said. How long do you give this drug? No, the life drugs. Long will continue. But how long do you continue your drugs? How, yeah. how long do you? Yeah, see the data on the vitamin E and pyoglutazone was for 96 weeks. So that was the trial prevents they said 96 weeks, right? But then in clinical practice, when we use vitamin E, we don't give it for more than six months. Number okay. one, that is. And saroglitas are, as I said, one year. Uh, the second question is, uh, I believe it's a very important question. Again, uh, this is a question on uh, Dr. Suman had asked that uh, do you alcoholics have support? Non-alcoholic treatment is just physical activity, more of a, so you're giving about treatment in the patient's hand. So this is what we call, uh, what we call it increasing the uh, involvement of patient by support, uh, creating support groups. Absolutely. So what is your opinion about creating support group for those patients who have a fatty liver disease. I absolutely agree. And I think uh, very recently, last week only, I was trying to answer a survey, a global survey on NAFL policy, uh, which was shared with us from the easel. And they were actually asking us this question that do you have any support groups in the country? Do you have any social groups? And I actually had to say, and that I, we had a core committee and I spoke to different people. Uh, Professor S.P. Singh told me that they have a Klinga Liver Foundation. They do work for the care of their patients with fatty liver disease. You, you do believe that we should create? Yes, I do believe. Absolutely. People. And the, we are the people, so all, the, all the doctors or the gastroenterologists who are working, who, who can uh, we can increase our awareness among patients to create support group and therefore among themselves so chat together and uh, and get treated that way. Uh, we believe that's very important. Yeah, I, I was coming to that. And then in the same survey, they also asked us about the any strategies from the government on the liver health or on nutrition, which are there in written, or do you have in uh, social groups? And we don't have any. And I absolutely agree that all these things have to start from the uh, primary school education. We need to tell them about the healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, and this epidemic, you know, can be controlled only by prevention rather than by these drugs, which we talked today. Yeah. You think this is worse than Corona? <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know whether you say if, if uh, fatty liver and corona is a subject by itself let me say that today evening we have another webinar so okay, if uh, right, people right. are interested in listening to corona and nephil we can discuss there Dr. Saraswat, do we close now with your permission yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. I think one very crisp and a very quick question that Ajay has to answer is from uh, Professor Jang Delavri in Chandigarh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Can we accept phase three trial data published in abstract without peer review, which is happening with some of the more recently uh, produced drugs and people are rushing in to use them? Which, what do you think? I, I, I agree. I think uh, this is still not uh, published as a full paper. Uh, but then I don't know, I mean, what data was, you know, given to the authorities and what data was presented. So obviously this was not only the phase two and the phase three data, which was presented and the real life data. I think the, probably the results or the decision is probably based on that. Right. Okay. Govind, I think uh, here we must uh, now thank uh, Dr. Ajay for an excellent session, for a very good um, coverage of a uh, vast area in a very precise and uh, detailed manner. And uh, I think we will have a list of about 350 questions of which we've been able to take up probably about not more than 30, 25, 30 questions. So maybe at some point when you are free from your webinar, hectic webinaring, you can uh, think of answering some of these questions with the help of the ISG secretariat. Sure, Many sure, of sure. You repeat questions. Uh, would you suppose we, we send you these questions? Yeah, um, you can mail me the questions and I will try to answer yeah, as many. Oh, oh, then what we'll say, we'll do all these questions and, and they're answered. We'll, we'll put on the website, which is sure. ISG Masterclass website. Right. And there one can log on to see all these uh, questions. Oh, so, uh, thank you, Ajay, very much for a wonderful, wonderful thank talk. And, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, let me remind you that we have a next webinar scheduled on, on uh, April 22nd. And this, again, we believe is a very important topic. Uh, that how do we approach a patient who is found to have a uh, SO in the pancreas? And, and uh, is a bit difficult and challenging topic, and for which we have uh, invited Dr. Swinder Rana from Chandigarh uh, to speak to you on this Wednesday from five to six. Thank you, Dr. Swaraswath. Thank you, Dr. Ajay, uh, for the wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Yogita, and thank you, everyone, for this. Thanks, Govind. Thanks. Bye -bye. Uh, I bye -bye. think bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank have you. Have a nice Sunday. Have a nice Sunday. Thank you. Bye-bye.